theme this year is to pursue wisdom. And if you're going to pursue wisdom, wisdom that is from above, not earthly wisdom. The book of James talks about that. Earthly wisdom is sensual and devilish and so forth. But wisdom that is from above, you cannot pursue wisdom that is from above without going to the Word of God. And that's where we're going to go this morning. Proverbs chapter 1, beginning reading in verse number 8. My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. For they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head, and chains about thy neck. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, Come with us, let us lay wait for blood, and let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave, and whole as those that go down into the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse. My son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path. For their feet run to evil and make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. And they lay wait for their own blood. They lurk privately for their own lives. So are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. And let's pray. Dearly Father, Lord, we thank You once again for the day You've given us today. And Lord, above all, we thank You for Your Word this morning that we can open up and we can study. And Lord, at this time, I pray You'll be with me now as a vessel that we'll preach forth Your Word this morning, that we as hearers will grow because of the preaching of the Word of God this morning. May it dwell richly within our lives, Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we talk about wisdom, the first question we have to ask ourselves is, how do we learn wisdom, and how do we exhibit God's wisdom in our daily lives? The bulletin this morning, the book of Proverbs, wisdom for daily life. And I say this, if we're not careful, we try to relegate wisdom to and living according to wisdom to Sunday. And can I say true wisdom is a 24-hour day? And 365 days a year, in fact, this year I think it's 366 days, I think. The reality is this, we learn wisdom by listening to God's Word and, and living according to it. But too often in this world, our mind is so busy listening to everything else. Do you realize we live in a world where we rarely ever, and I used to kind of argue more on, but hear quietness? The reality is this, it's always it always seems to be loud. The reality is you go to the store and guess what? There's noise. You go, you go into your car and instantaneously, if you start it up, there's noise. And not just the noise of the engine. And uh, depending on whether or not you have a catalytic converter or not, it may be a little bit louder. But you hear noise from radios and you hear noises from devices. And you, you go home and there tends to always be noise. And too often in the midst of a world here filled with noise, we, the great tragedy is that there's so much noise that we don't take time to listen to God. We listen to everything else. In fact, oftentimes, we will go to other avenues uh, of, of help. You know, we will we'll listen to offers that, that may have some great counsel. And we may listen to, to uh, television programs and talk radio and, and things like that to gain advice that where we have a perfect world, word to give us that advice. And I'm not saying any of that to degrade the one, but rather to lift up Christ. And the reality is this, we need to be careful in our busy world that we take time to go to the perfect Word. And as we think about wisdom this morning, we, we must go to what has been called the book of wisdom within the Word of God, which is filled with wisdom, and that's the book of Proverbs. This morning I want to talk to you about choosing companions wisely straight from the wisdom that is in the Word of God. Now, I don't know about you, but when it comes to choosing companions, I think the best person to tell us is God Himself through the wisest man that God said ever lived, and that was Solomon. The first thing I want to say about choosing companions is choosing companions wisely begins with instruction at home. Look at verses 8 and 9. The Bible says, My son, hear the instruction of thy father. And forsake not the law of thy mother, for they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head, and chains about thy neck. Verse number 8 tells us that the family is the primary, primary teaching entity. Can I say to, to uh, us together today, and I understand we're all in different stages of life, some here in, in the congregation today, your kids. 
And can I say, your primary teaching entity is at home. To some of us, we're parents, and we have this opportunity, this responsibility to realize that, guess what? Our primary teaching entity is the home. Here, first, we find the instruction of a father in verse number 8, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Solomon, the wisest man, the Bible says, the wisest man to ever live, a wise father, is telling his son, listen, you need to listen to my instruction. You need to make sure that you don't forsake the law of thy mother. In other words, to put it in our vernacular today, uh, Solomon's saying, boy, you better listen to me, and boy, you better listen to your mama. That's what he's saying. Just to break it down into our vernacular, that's what he's saying. And for good or bad fathers, we impact our children. And for good or bad mothers, you impact your children. In fact, can I say this to you, fathers? Fathers are the ones from whom little children get the perspective of God. Oftentimes, children who had a very rough father, when they think of God, all they can think of is that Heavenly Father as being a really rough person. And they focus mainly on the judgment of God. A, 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 a person who is maybe a little bit too lenient and lets their kid get by with everything. They think God is a man there that lets you just get by with everything. And the perfect thing that a child should realize of God is God is a balance of both law and grace. He's a, he's a, he's a God of justice and He's a God of mercy. He's a God who is holy and He is a God of love. And can I say, that is the type of example we should be to our children. And they often get that view. As I think about children growing up in the house, the ideal influence comes from a balanced parental training where both parents... Can I say this? You say, which one's more important? Is the father more important or the mother more important? Both. The reality is this. They work together in harmony. They work together to rear children to rear children that will grow to be people of character, to be people of morals that we find in the Word of God. That's what I love about the Word of God. The Word of God is where we get our morality. And as, 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 as people, we are to realize that as we uh, choose wisdom and as we work to choose wise companions, it begins in the home. Can I say it's our responsibility in the home to teach the reality of how to choose companions? Oftentimes, kids will, will get all hooked up in all sorts of different messes. And oftentimes, it is because, not all the time, but oftentimes it's because of a failure of instruction. Can I say this? As we think about this, there's instruction and there is teaching. If we're not careful as parents, we expect the teacher to educate. We expect the psychologist to counsel. We expect the coach to be the one that gives them the discipline. You know, we put them in all these different areas so they can gain all these different character traits. It's the pastor's job to instill values. And the reality is that is a portion of their responsibility as a teacher. It's the teacher's responsibility to educate. That's their job. It's the, it's the, it's the uh, coach's job to teach discipline. I like coaches that teach discipline. I, I've had different coaches throughout my time, and, and I've had the kind that's like, we're just here to have fun. And you can strike out, but it's okay. And, and there was no discipline. Then I had the coach where we showed up to ball practice the first day, and we barely picked up a baseball. He told us how we were to sit, how we were to tie our shoes, the way in which we're supposed to run. And, I mean, it was, it was structured, and it was disciplined. There was no, when he's ready to talk to us, we stand up with our arms crossed. There was no, we plop down on the ground. No, you go down on the ground with one knee, your right knee down, your left knee parallel, your left arm on your knee, your back straight, and your, your right hand. I guess we could do whatever we want to do with the right hand. But, I mean, it was, it was some big instruction, and there was discipline there. Can you guess which team did the best? The one with the structure. There was that discipline. In basketball, boy, we had, we had discipline. And, boy, you had to run. I'm going to tell you, that, uh, it was one of those things. I learned this, and it probably helped me through college more than just about anything else. And that was this. You can do more than you think you can. Boy, we used to do these running exercises, and I hated them. I still hate them. But we had to do this running exercise. We had to do it in a certain amount of time. And guess what happened if you didn't do it in a certain amount of time? Every now and then, what would happen is you had to run these things called suicides. And I don't know why they called them suicides except for maybe after you were done, you contemplate. I don't know. <laughs> but we would do those. But then he decided to change what we did. If you didn't make it the first time, then you caught your breath and you did it again. Now, I remember thinking, if you can't do it the first time, after getting winded, how are you going to do it the second time? And guess what? Most of the people who failed the first time 
were able to get it done so. Now, I remember one time there was a boy, it took him four times, but he got it done. I don't know how he was still walking after it was done, but he got it done. But the reality is this, what it taught me is you can push yourself further than you think you can. And I, you know what else I learned? I learned most of the time I was able to get it done the first time because I didn't want to have to pay the consequences of not getting it done the first time. And so, yes, it's the coach's responsibility to teach discipline, but it's not just the coach's responsibility to teach discipline. Yes, it's, it's the pastor's job to preach and teach the Word of God and that Word of God to instill values into a family. But the reality is, it's not just that person's job. The reality is the majority of the responsibility remains with the parents to teach these things. To t- instill values, to instill discipline, to push them to Christ and in the Word of God. And we need to be careful that we don't realize, that we, rather that we realize, that it is the home's responsibility to teach on how to choose companions wisely to those who say, well, I guess I can just check out of this because I'm not a parent. Or my kids are gone. Can I say, it's still your responsibility to learn new things from the Word of God. We get this idea that once I'm done teaching it, I don't have to learn anymore. But the reality is we should pursue wisdom throughout all our days until we're in heaven and we are in eyesight with the one with whom we seek to please. The reality is this, we should continue to learn. But to teach means to bring about or to give learning, to show how to do. And the reality is the Word of God is that which teaches us. Instruction carries the idea of discipline. Did you know anything, well, you've heard this before, anything worth doing takes discipline? It really does. The reality is we have to be disciplined. And it's one of those things that we must work to do. I'll say this, oftentimes, it's the thing that could save us that oftentimes we regret hearing. There's a story of, of uh, in the jungles of Sri Lanka. Now, we, of course, when I think of Sri Lanka, the first thing I think of is our missionary friend that just got kicked out of Sri Lanka. But this was years ago in the jungles of Sri Lanka. There were 15 soldiers of the commando unit, and they found these two dogs. They saved two dogs, and they adopted them, and they sort of became the mascot of their unit. Well, one day they're going through, and, and they were completing this hike with their with their dogs, and the dogs began to bark and wouldn't shut up. You know what I'm talking about, where the dogs just, rah, 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 and you're like, be quiet. And they won't. They just won't be quiet. And it was about to drive them crazy, and they were beginning to get angry at these dogs when they realized the dogs began circling a specific area and just kept barking and barking, and finally like, what in the world are you barking at? And come to find out, there were, there were I think it was 10 or 15 uh, mines around the water hole where they were headed to that could have killed them. But thanks to the barking, though it may have seemed annoying to them, those dogs saved their lives. The reality is this. The reality is oftentimes it's frustrating and it's annoying when we're constantly hearing, don't do this or don't do that or do this and do that. But oftentimes it's that thing that may annoy us that is actually there to save us. I don't know about you, but oftentimes I'll, I'll, I'll find myself maybe getting frustrated about something only to realize later that it was that thing I was frustrated at that helped me. It was that thing that, that annoyed me, that helped me. If, if, we're, if we're, we're wise, we will listen to the warnings that are there for us. We'll listen to the warnings. I, I know I have uh, uh, been, been driving along before, and I'm, I'm going to speed limit, you know. And somebody flashes their light at me. And I'm thankful for that because that tells me, guess what? They're warning me about something ahead. Now, it could be many things. There could be an accident ahead. There could be a bridge out ahead. There could be a patrolman ahead. <laughs> but there's something ahead, and they're flashing their light, and they're warning me. And boy, aren't you glad when you see that? Now, I'll be honest with you, sometimes it's frustrating because some of these vehicles, it seems like when they hit bumps, you ever notice that? It looks like they're flashing their light at So I slow down, and I'm extra cautious, and there's nothing. I'm thinking, they just hit a bump. And uh, that's all it was. But the reality is there are oftentimes warnings that may not be as exciting to us, like you don't need to do that. You need to be careful with this. Or maybe you need to do that. You know, those times like when you go to the doctor and they tell you what you need to do and you're like, oh. again. But oftentimes those warnings are there for us. Oftentimes as we study the Word of God, we find warnings within it. I heard the story of a man who, as he read the Bible, every time he saw something that he didn't like, he took it out. He ripped that page out. 
And if you were to go through his Bible, there were, there were holes all in it. But the reality is, though sometimes we may read the Word of God and we may face, find passages of the Word of God that they're just kind of hard to take, they're there for our own good. We realize that it's when, as a child, uh, learns from his parents, it adds honor to their life. By the way, if you learn from your Heavenly Father and you, you wisely uh, instill in your life the principles that He teaches you, then it adds honor to your life. In the book, in verse number 9, For they shall be an ornament of grace under thy head, and chains about thy neck. At the early Olympic events, they would, they would receive this crown on their head. It, was made of, it wasn't made of gold or silver, it was made of leaves. And, and that was the utmost honor that one could receive at the Olympic Games, at the early Olympic Games. I think of now, I enjoy watching Olympics. During the Olympic time, I will watch sporting events that I would never, ever, ever watch in my life. But you have the best of the best doing some unique things. It may be just them going down this big old ice hill, <laughs> kind of like some people do now, and, and our snowstorm and so forth. But going down an ice hill in a bobsled, you know, and boy, they're flying, and boy, they're, I mean, they're flying. They're going. It may be curling. Not curling their hair, but curling. And they've got these big stones, and they have like this ice thing, and they've got these targets, and, and uh, you, one person slides these, these big stones, and somebody else goes in front, and they brush the ice. And as it gets closer, they brush more. And I think there's two different ways that they brush. One of them kind of smooths the ice out to help it slide better. And then at, at a certain point, I think what they actually do is kind of almost scratch the ice up to slow it down so it can be closer to the target. I would never watch that. But boy, during Olympics, I will. But my favorite part of the Olympics is always the part where the United States is number one. And they're on the top of the platform. The flags go up. And the United States flag of America is at the top, and the national anthem is playing. And they receive their medal, and they get that hunk. You know what they're being? They're being honored. Can I say this? It's just like that. When you live according to the Word of God, and you're obedient to the Word of God, it brings honor. Unfortunately, disobedience and rebellion leads to destruction. Secondly, well, first of all, we said choosing companions wisely involves or, or begins in home instruction. But secondly, choosing companions wisely involves avoiding evil companions. This is where we leave the house. And can I say, point number one was primarily to parents and primarily to people who still have children at home. But can I say this? This is for all of us. That choosing companions wisely involves avoiding evil companions. There's a man by the name of Mike Wood. He began a sign shop. And when he began the sign shop, he was trying to figure out ways that, that uh, he, could, he could sort of get his name out there and so forth and, and sort of begin his business and get his business uh, sort of off the ground and going. And so he decided he would make some cutouts, some cutouts of people. In, and they were, they were life-size cardboard, if you would, type uh, signs of people. And they were little kids, and he put them out, out there in front of his shop. The interesting thing, though, was this. His shop was a long age a highway in which people would fly at quick speed. Well, once he put those those cardboard cutouts out there that were life-size and they looked like kids and stuff, traffic began to slow down immensely. Because they'd be, they'd be flying down the road and they'd see this poor kid out by the road and they would, they would slow down. So much so that people began to see that and uh, it, it ended up being, instead of him just advertising for his business, he was now helping the community as traffic slowed down and, and it was a much safer environment. So much so that now that person, actually his main part of his business is advertising, selling life-size cutouts so that you can help slow down people in your neighborhood. I don't know if you've ever been uh, in, a, in a subdivision or a neighborhood where people are just flying and it's annoying. On my road, people tend to fly down the road and, and sometimes it can, it can be kind of annoying. And that became his business. Now, you say, why would parents do that? Why would, why would you go online and search for a cardboard cutout and buy a cardboard cutout? You know why? Because parents work hard to protect their children. You work hard, I believe, as parents to protect your children. But do you know where, where the danger is more than just a physical danger? Is a spiritual danger. There are dangers. People, especially peers, are what pose the most danger. Did you know the most danger your children can, can really face is from peers, those around them, those that surround them is the greatest danger. 
In verses chapter 10 through 14, we find Solomon writing and warning about those who would mislead the children. Verse number 10, the Bible says here, My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. You realize the pressure by a peer group, especially for youth, but also for adults, is so strong that in fact I believe it's one of the biggest, the biggest temptations for people is posed by those around them. And Solomon's writing to his son and says, My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. The reality is the pressure is really strong. The pressure is strong by others, and oftentimes it's not necessarily a spoken pressure, though oftentimes it is. Sometimes it's a perceived pressure. But the pressure from those around is strong. Therefore, here, Solomon is writing to his son and saying, Listen, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Temptation comes oftentimes when people who have departed from the straight and narrow path, from the path of righteousness, are off that path, and now they're trying to entice those who are on that path to come off of that path. And he's saying, listen, if they entice you, consent now not. In verse 11, if they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood, let us lurk highly for the innocent without cause. Verse 12, let us swallow them up alive into the grave, and whole as those that go down into the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one thirst. In verse 11, we find that sin entices, sin entices us by saying, this is the quick road to success. Verse number 11, let us lay wait for blood. Let us lay wait for the innocent without cause. Hey, listen, we're going to go get what we want from the person who has no clue. In other words, he's saying, listen, we're going to gain at the expense of someone else. And then in verse number 12, we find that their murderous drive is further revealed as they say, let us swallow them up as the grave. Now, I'm not sure if that's a reference back to Korah. There was a time when when Korah was leading a rebellion against Moses and the ground swallowed them up. It may just simply be to reference as when someone passes away, you lay them in the grave. But the reality is sin will take you further than you want to go. The reality is the price for sin is much more than we often want to pay. But in, when, we're, when we're put in this pressure group, they will entice us. Can I say this? Sin is fun. Say, what? I didn't expect to come to church in this special afternoon time through the snowstorm. And here sin is fun. But sin is fun. That's why we do it. That's why it's a temptation. I don't know about you, but I have never, ever, ever walked in the grocery store and been tempted by celery. I never have. Never do I walk in the grocery store and I grab a buggy and I'm pushing the buggy along and it's almost like that buggy gets pulled over to the Oprah. I don't. Now, some of you may love celery and okra and that's the way it is for you. I'm not being jealous because my celery and okra is good for you. But boy, I tell you what, there are times I'll be walking through the grocery store and that candy aisle, it's like it's calling my name. It's like the candy aisle is going, hey, I'm over here. Look at this sale. You love saving money. And boy, this is on sale. It's even a closeout, which means they're not going to have it again. This is your last chance. It's almost as, and I know, candy doesn't talk audibly. <laughs> but boy, it talks and it's advertisements and boy, it looks so good. And you know what? Celery and okra is good for you, and I hate to be the bearer of bad news if you don't already know this, but candy isn't. But I enjoy candy, and I don't enjoy celery. You know what? You sin in your specific sins that you struggle with. You know why? Because you enjoy them. The Bible even tells us that sin is pleasurable for a season. The reality is this. That candy is really good. For a season. Many of you have heard this story before, and for some it may be new, but when I was young, me and the neighbor girl decided we were going to have a competition. We had a bunch of fudge, like gallon buckets of fudge. And we decided we were going to have a competition. We both loved, loved fudge. So we began, and we had this competition, and it was who could eat the most fudge. You know how it is? You start out, and you're like, mm, this is good. I could eat like a fudge. You get a few pieces in, and it's like, whew. This is kind of sweet. 31 pieces in. She had 30 pieces. Now, for anybody, that's a ton of sugar, a ton of chocolate, and a ton of bad for you. (laughs) 
oh man, boy, we enjoyed it for a season. Our season didn't last long because we were sick as a dog not much longer after that. It was terrible. I didn't eat fudge for a long time. And I guarantee you this, I will never, ever, I pledge, I will never, ever in my life ever eat 31 pieces of fudge in one sitting ever again. You know why? Because I realize the cost for indulging in something that was pleasurable. Can I say this sin is much like eating way too much fudge in the sense that it is pleasurable. In fact, when you first begin in it, boy, it's fun. This is awesome. Could life get any better? And then you find yourself, you're convicted. You know this is wrong, but you continue in it because maybe because of peer pressure. I had to beat her. I wasn't going to let no girl beat me and eat fudge. I'm competitive. I mean, I'm competitive, and I'm definitely not going to get beat by a girl that's my age in eating fudge. I'm going to win this thing. What? Peer pressure. That peer pressure often comes in sin. Well, I'm already in it, and, and I, I already told them I would do this, and I don't want to back out on them, and I don't want to, I don't want to hurt them, and I don't want to, you know, I told them I would do it. I'm going to be a person of my word. I'm suddenly going to be a person of character doing sin. But the reality is, I mean, you begin to get convicted, and then finally you just get sick. The Bible says sin, when it is finished, bringeth for death. The Bible passage we looked at this morning, let us lay wait for blood in verse 12. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and hold as those that go down into the pit. He says in verse 10, my son, as sinners entice he can sin thou not. You know why? Because Solomon realized that sin will take you much further than you plan on going. And that pleasure of sin is for a season. Reality is this, the sin will take you much further. Verse 13, we shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Oftentimes they will lure you with a promise that you will have everything you want. Can I say this? You can have riches untold and not be at peace. The reality is this, the, the false companions, the companions, the unwise companions, the foolish companions, they will lure you with the promise of temporary substance. But realize any substance of this earth is temporary. I'm thankful that, that though sin brings about destruction, following the will of God brings about joy for us. So it really comes down to this when you're choosing between following the foolish companions or following the Word of God and surrounding yourself with wise companions, the real, really the difference is the payoff. You want temporary, instantaneous pleasure or you want joy forevermore. But they will promise. Satan will try to make sin seem beneficial to you. He will try to show you how this sin will benefit you in a great way. In fact, he may even try to deceive you and try to help you see how this sin will help you spiritually. Isn't that what he did in the Garden of Eden? Didn't he tell, didn't he tell Eve that, hey, if you eat of this, suddenly you will be wise and suddenly you'll know good and evil and this is going to be wonderful and is sin wonderful? Just another lie from Satan. In verse 14, we find a powerful, powerful, uh, I guess you would say, pressure by the peers cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one person. And make it seem exciting. We're going to go lay it the way. We're going to gain all this precious stuff. And we're going to have one purse. We're just going to have it all together. And we're going to enjoy this. Cast in your lot among us. Can I say this? Friendship sealed by bonding and sin won't last long. Oh, just give it some time. Give it some time and there will be that strife. You know why? Because the relationship that's built on sin is destined to be destroyed. But boy, the peer pressure will come. So Solomon, first of all, begins this morning with choosing wise companions, begins with instruction at home. But secondly, it, be, it, it involves avoiding evil companions. But number three, verses 15 through 19, we find that choosing companions wisely seeks wisdom's counsel. My son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path, for their feet run to evil. 
and make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. And they lay wait for their own blood. They work privately for their own lives. So are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owner thereof. Choosing companions wisely seeks wisdom counsel. Can I say, when we go along with the crowd and we refuse to listen to truth, our own appetite becomes our level of what is right or wrong. What we desire becomes our master, and we will do whatever our heart desires. Sin will tell you, just follow your heart. But the Bible tells us that the heart is deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? But when you make your heart the, the, the thing that will that, that guides all of your decisions and you shun the principle of the Word of God, guess what happens? You find yourself in a disastrous situation. That's why the Bible says, Delight thyself in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. Delight yourself in this. And you'll seek wisdom counsel. In verse 15 here, we find a, a father appealing to his son to make right decisions. To refrain his foot from the evil companion's path. And can I say this? We've got a heavenly father that pleads with his children. And can, this, is what's, this is what's interesting. When it comes to, to childhood, you're really only a child for, I don't know, there'll be arguments of how long you're a child, but... Let's just go with the world's line of 18 years. But when it comes to being a child of God, you're a child of God forevermore. And the Heavenly Father pleads with you to refrain your feet from the path of the evil. He's pleading and and He's giving wise counsel. And can I say, you and I need to make sure that we don't put our trust in good resolutions. New Year's resolutions, right, were made a few weeks ago and... And uh, I don't know what the percentages are, but I'll say this. Probably a huge percentage of people have already quit or failed on their New Year's resolution. And we are 24 days, 24 days into the New Year. But oftentimes people want to build their life upon resolutions. And resolutions are failures. Can I say this? You and I need to build our lives upon Christ for He will never fail. He said, I will never fail thee nor forsake thee. He says, I'll never forsake thee. He said that he would never leave us nor forsake us. And and the the wise father is saying, listen, you need to refrain your foot from their path for their feet shed run to evil and make haste to shed blood. The the path of sin is all down here. Now, I know what we think right now. You know, there's, there's snow outside. It's starting to melt and... There's a good chance by the time we get out, we won't see any snow. But, but the snow's starting to melt and so forth. But over these last few days, boy, there's been some snow. And I've seen on Facebook people posting pictures of the sled ride, right? And boy, it's fun sliding down that hill. It really is. What's difficult oftentimes is to stop. I saw a video of somebody that several of us know, and, and uh, he decided he was going to snowboard down the hill. And... The caption said, wait for it. So you know something's coming. And sure enough, here he goes. He's coming down the hill, and he's he's doing such a good job. And then down he goes, down the camera goes, and it was one of those classic, you know, America's Funniest Video type videos and so forth. And I'll tell you, oftentimes, the the, the slide down the hill is fun, but it's that sudden stop that gets you. It's kind of like somebody said, uh, you know, I don't have a fear of falling. I have a fear of a sudden stop. The reality is that's how the life of sin is. It's like sliding down a hill. The problem is at the end of the hill, there's a sudden stop, and it's a price that we don't want to pay. We find Solomon using an example here in verse number 17. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. Birds didn't take the bait. You know why? They clearly see the trap. In other words, what he's saying is, listen, you need to be smarter than than the foolish one who sets a trap for you. The reality is this. There are traps out there everywhere that are seeking to trap us. Sin wants to trap you because sin realizes once it gets your heart and once it grips your heart, it takes a hold that is hard to break. 
And ultimately what comes down to it is they lay wait for their own blood. They lurk privately for their own life. They're not there for you. They're there to get you. And sin is not for you. Satan is not for you. He's out to get you. And the reality is this, is that you will be the one harmed. The Bible speaks of greed, and wisdom does not follow a heart of greed, but sin does. The Bible says in verse 19, So are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. I believe today we have a lot of people who are alive, but they're not truly living. And what I mean by that is they don't have an abundant life. They're merely existing. You know why? Because they have fallen for the trap of sin. And serving the sin nature is a life that is miserable. But serving a life and walking in the will of God and walking with the purity of the Word of God and walking after Christ and pursuing wisdom is the way that God gives to us abundant life. Can I say abundant life does not come without the free gift of salvation. And God wants you to live life, but yet so many people are living their life thinking that they're going to get by. But we know this, living wickedly doesn't pay. The Bible says, be not deceived. God is not mocked for whatsoever a man soweth. That shall he also reap. You know this, if you go in springtime, don't plant any seeds right now. They're not going to grow. But in springtime, you till your garden up and you plant corn seeds. And you go out there and you work with your corn seeds. Meaning that you, you know, you've done what gardeners do. I don't garden, but you, you know, you, you take care of it. You weed the garden and you fertilize the garden and you water the garden when it's dry and all that. You know what's going to come up, right? Okra. No. You planted corn. Corn's coming up. The reality is the same with mankind. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. If you sow sin, seeds of sin, you know what's going to come back? The reality is this, that, that a life that is sown in greed is not truly going to be a life that's enjoyable and worth living. There was a relief pitcher for the Oakland A's in 1992. He signed a two-year contract with them, Dennis Eckerson was his name. He was a great relief pitcher. He could have joined other teams for a lot more money and made a ton more money, and, and uh, they were quite uh, stunned when he re-signed with the Oakland A's. But he realized this, that it was the Oakland A's that gave him his first chance. He realized that it was the Oakland A's who gave him the second chance after he was recovering from alcoholism because he was an alcoholic and he went through rehab and so forth to recover from that. And so loyalty took place over grief. Can I say this? It's about time that we as Christians take loyalty to the Word of God and loyalty to the God who has saved us and sent His only begotten Son to die on the cross for us and be buried and resurrected, triumphed over death, hell, and the grave, to purchase our redemption over grief. Because see, it's greed that leads us to take having a life that has been taken away. The Bible says in verse 19, So are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owner's thereof. Greed, if not kept, leads to a life of destruction. Sin is enticing. There's no doubt whatsoever that sin is enticing. That's why it lures us. That's why we get stuck in the trap of sin, because it's enticing. And you know what? Each of us have different appetites. Earlier I was talking about, you know, celery never called my name. Or okra. And I saw some, some facial expressions out there like, well, I'd love to have some okra. Now, with us having an afternoon service because of the snow today, um, it's hopefully after lunch. But if you've not eaten yet, I'm sorry. But, but the reality is this, boy, some of you are like, oh, I love okra. I don't care if it's boiled or fried. Now, I can eat fried okra, boiled okra. It's just not for me. It's just not. If you like it, you can have all of it. Okay? But the reality is this, for some of you, that's what you like. I could say Reese's Peanut Butter Cup. And some of you here could be like, I could care less. That's great, because if somebody offers you one, I'll take it. <laughs> it's one of those things. We have different desires. For some of you, it could say fried chicken, and you would think, Ugh, I like grease, candy, lemon. And some of you are like, oh, just give me a bottle of hot sauce and let's go to town. Amen. You know, because we have different desires. And you know, the reality is our sin nature has different desires, too. 
Some of you can look at something and go, oh, I could care less. And some of you could look and go, whoo, I'll take it. I think about this when it comes to physical things. Oftentimes, it often includes what you're going through at that time. I remember when I decided I was going to quit drinking Coca-Cola. And Sprite and Dr. Pepper, as well as in college, I actually went a long time. I don't know why I ever took a drink of one again, but I went for years without having one. I'm not sure exactly how long. I want to say about five or six years without having any Coca-Cola, Sprite, Dr. Pepper, so forth. But the first three months were the worst. And I remember within that first three months, oh, by the way, within that time period of the first three months, I started working at a restaurant where we could drink all the Coke we wanted. And this is what's interesting. My whole time working at that restaurant where I could have all the Coke that I wanted, I never drank a single one. But anyway, it was just probably good. Because at the end of that, at the end thereof would have been the ways of death. But, but uh, I quit drinking them when one night my roommate comes in. I had a roommate that never would offer me anything. I'm not sure why he didn't like me. And I'm not sure, but he didn't. And I probably did something, I don't know, but, but he didn't. Maybe I took the bed he was going to get. I don't know. But he, he would come in and bring pizza and never offer me. He, he'd ask that offer everybody else to. But he never, it was weird. But one night he comes in and he had ice cold, IBC, cream soda. Now, I'll be honest with you. In the, in the time where I'm like, I don't need it, I've decided I'm not going to drink those. It wasn't alcohol. But I had that feeling like I'm being tempted to sin. There would have been nothing wrong with me to, for me, morally, for me to drink an IBC cream soda. It would be delicious, too. I want to tell you, boy, the pressure was there. When, when probably four months before, I'd be like, no, nah, I'm good, I don't need one. Boy, suddenly, because I was depriving myself of it, boy, I mean, I was sitting there, I'm like, mm, man, I want one. Of course, the, you know how guys are. They're pouring it on their like, You know, I mean, they're, they're just pouring it on, and it's like, oh. You know, oftentimes we go through different times in our life where certain sins are more tempting. Just as for me going through that period of time where I was weaning myself off of Coca-Colas and so forth, boy, that drink looks so now, I could go to Kroger right after church and walk right by them, and it not bother me. I'd probably just increase their sales because everybody's going to go buy one now, but, but it's going to back to walk by. And it's not that big a deal, but during that time, it was. And can I say, at different times in your life, different sins are going to be so enticing. But as the psalmist, I mean, as the proverb uh, says, and as our Heavenly Father says, my son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. In other words, he's saying, don't give in. He's saying, listen, sin's going to entice you. But the end thereof, it's the ways of death. And you don't want to go down a path that's going to lead to destruction. So rather than you getting at the edge of the cliff and us trying to have to pull you back off the cliff, instead of us having to pick up the pieces at the bottom of the cliff, I'm putting a guardrail before the cliff saying, don't go down that path. And can I say for us this morning, we need to choose our companions wisely because the pressure of tears will push you beyond limits that you thought you would never go. And that sin will take you further than you want to go. It will make you pay more than you ever wanted to pay. And it will hold you in your grip and you will stay longer than you ever wanted to stay. Can I encourage you this morning in closing that we can't be friendly with sin and not be enticed by it. You know, for anybody that struggled with alcoholism, the best thing to not do is to go to the bar. Someone struggling with alcoholism, well, I'm going to go, my buddies are there, and I'll just have a club soda. Not if you hang around long enough. For someone who's struggling with, with sin, you've got to realize, no matter what the sin is, it can be alcoholism, it can be... You know, you know the reality is this, Sometimes the sin we struggle with may be gossip, and you know the worst thing you can do is hang around all your friends that gossip all the time? You know what you have to do? You have to place yourself away from that sin because you can't be friendly with sin and not be enticed by it. The reality is this. Lastly, you cannot win the battle against temptation on your own strength. You need the help of the Holy Spirit. If you're here this morning and you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, You've never come to Him for salvation and put your faith in Him and Him alone. I encourage you to do that this morning because without His help, you can't win the battle. 
It's for him and him alone. For those of us who are saved, remember this as sinners in high school, it's not now. It's not now. Listen to the instruction of the Word of God. Pursue wisdom. Read the Word of God. Get, get the Word of God in you. Let it dwell richly in you. So that we can pursue wisdom. And when sinners in Christ we won't be saved. I mentioned just a moment ago that we need to make sure that we don't spend all our time around those who attempt us to do wrong. Choose our companions wisely. But as long as you're in this world, you're going to be tempted. You know, sometimes you, you, you say, oh, I have to be around them. I have to go to work. Yeah, you do. That's why we need to dwell in the Spirit of God so that when we're at work and sinners in Texas, we can have the strength to not be sin. When we go into the community and somebody does something that's just, oh, it hurts us, and boy, we want to lash out. We want to go into our sin nature and just give them a piece of our mind. We can consent not. There may be even somebody there egging you on or adding you on. There's, I had a conversation with somebody not too long ago about which one it is. But boy, they're just pushing you on. And you ever notice this? Oftentimes when two people want to fight, there's always a group around them going, fight, fight, fight. You know, that's just the way it is at school. That's the way it would be, right? And uh, normally what people going, no, guys, you know, this is really a fun. No, no, it's like you're pushing them on. I was in Walmart Wednesday night before church, and uh, it wasn't good. I went over to the clothing section uh, to look at something, and suddenly I hear this loud noise. Two people going back and forth. And there's these three teenage girls walking along. And there's this woman probably in her 20s, and, and she's walking behind them, and they're saying a lot of things I will not repeat from this microphone or away from this microphone. And I thought, boy, they're about to go at it. And, of course, the two girls are walking ahead, but the one's kind of lingering back because you know, she's tempted to you know, go at it, you know. And the other one, who should be the adult in the situation, is the one who's really fueling the situation, and there's somebody behind them. And guess what? Instead of, instead of the people with them going, Come on, let's go. Just leave it alone. And the other one's going, leave them alone. You know what's happening? They're just letting it go. And if anything, they're probably fueling a little bit. I thought, I'm not going to have to break up a fight. Well, finally, the one kind of moved on, and I just sort of, not necessarily walked in the middle of it to break them apart, but I just kind of, you know, at least slowed this one down, you know, kind of walked in between it, and finally they went their separate ways. And sure enough, as soon as I turned that corner, there was this little lady who'd been working there for years. I don't know how long, but she had the gold stars. And, uh, and she's sitting there like, Oh, hey. <laughs> you know, and, and she was just watching the whole thing, and, and I said, "How are you doing?" She's like, "Good." <laughs> I think she had that look, kind of like I did. Oh no, I don't know what's about to go down, and, and the reality is, I don't know what would have went down if I had to break it up. But the reality is, we are living in a world where there is strife, and we're going to face temptation. We're going to face. You know, I was tempted to tell the old. I don't know exactly what went on, but I know this: the older one should be the more responsible one in the situation, and they were the one that seemed to be fueling the fire. And I kind of wanted to get some instruction on how an adult's supposed to act. But my son is sinners and high school can sit now. No, I have to do that. It wasn't my. It wasn't my place. It wasn't my time. But oftentimes, we're faced with this problem. We have to heed the word of God. Wisdom is what we must pursue. What is wisdom? Wisdom is not just knowledge. Wisdom is not just understanding. Wisdom is taking that knowledge and understanding and putting it in the action. My son, as sinners in high school, consent 